licensing of journalists, Lordi Media Journalisti Italiano, is my historical review and comparison. And I was looking for the star here. Okay, I'll just refer to the introduction. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so good morning, everybody. It's great to see a lot of people here. It's wonderful. This is a, one of those things in the academy that happens, and it's a defense of the thesis that a candidate for the master's, um, master's degree is, provides. And it's a very interesting uh, event. It's open, it's public, it's uh, part of the academic process. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start off with a presentation by Andrea. And uh, have you got your parents up? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. And it's wonderful to see all of your, you guys here, friends of uh, Andrea. Uh, and he's going to uh, make a presentation, which he'll explain to us in a moment. Then uh, after about 40 minutes or so, um, we'll have questions. The public is welcome to ask questions. The three. Uh, uh, I want to call them referees. The three people involved on the panel are Susan Swanberg, who's here, uh, Dave Premier, who's there, and my name is Jeff Oman. So, uh, and then no doubt ask probing questions about the thesis and the idea. What it is, it's a defense. It's an academic defense of an idea. So, it's, an, it's a very interesting idea, and we put it up for a defense to the world. At least Andrea puts it up for defense. So, ready to go? Yep, I just have a question myself. I don't know if it would be possible to have somebody like moving the slides for me or like do a Sure, no problem. I don't know if anybody I guess wants to do it. Uh, I can do it. Oh, you can do it? Um, yeah, I'm all looking at your what are you doing there? All right. Uh, licensing of journalists, Lord Inede Journalisti Italiano is my historical review and comparison. And yeah, we can move forward to So journalism is among the earliest professions. We really don't know where everything started, but we know that already the ancient Romans and the Acta Diurna was a news sheet which was a news sheet that was published around 100 years before Christ. And the main, the first real newspapers that showed up in Europe about 1600 years later in Germany. And from that moment on, journalism as a profession and journalists as human beings have been through a lot from crises, wars, pandemics. Uh, journalism has always found ways to thrive and pull through uh, all these. And uh, now new mass is arising with uh, the artificial intelligence that some people think may doom this profession, but while well, this gloomy prediction has yet to cope with this longer, long tenure profession, uh, is it's pretty clear that the main reason why journalism has been able to survive all these years is due to freedom. Freedom of word, freedom of journalists to express themselves and to reinvent themselves in many different forms, freedom has always been a paramount value for the journalistic profession. Uh, a nation where people are not free to express themselves is a nation that usually is under despotic control, so a nation that is lacking freedom. This was pretty clear for dictators throughout history. Hitler in Germany, Mussolini in Italy, Stalin in the USSR, all have tried and succeeded to different degrees to control the press. Um, the importance of media freedom is invaluable. It is enshrined in the first American con uh, con American the First Amendment of the American, the American Constitution, and also in the Article 21 of the Italian Constitution, uh, the uh, freedom of speech uh, is, uh, is present. In the First Ameri Amendment of the American Constitution, it says that Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of uh, freedom of speech or of the press, while the Article 21 of the Italian Constitution states that everyone has the right to freely express their thoughts in speech, writing, and any other means of dissemination, the press cannot be subjected to authorization or censorship. These two articles amendments may sound pretty similar, but the real life application of them is quite different. In the USA, freedom of speech is valued to a level where anyone is free to say almost anything, 
uh, as long as he's absent malice, as he was explicit in the 1964 US Supreme Court, New York Times versus Sullivan. He said in Italy and in Europe uh, in general, uh, freedom of speech is valid to the extent that it should not unfairly or maliciously harm uh, other people or groups or cultures. While this sound, may sound like a slight difference, it has really important real life consequences. Uh, regardless of the type of freedom that Article 21 of the Italian Constitution is referring to, that the press cannot be subjected to authorization or censorship, certainly appears in stark contrast with the Article 45 of Italian law, the one that, that it establishes the order of journalists. What this article says in big words is that basically to be a journalist in Italy, you have to be a member of the order of journalists, which, uh, Italian, uh, which is a Public law entity established by law number 69 of February 3rd, 1963. And uh, this, this law was called the regulation of the journalistic profession. And Italian journalists order main role is the maintenance and, of the professional register and the discipline of its members. The order is required by the law to guarantee the training and suitability of those entering the profession, as well as the protection and uh, respect of professional ethics. And the order is controlled by a main national governing body that uh, stays in Rome, divided then into several regional branches. Uh, on top of maintaining the register and the discipline of the members, the main task assigned to the order is protecting and ensuring the compliance with the ethical rules of the profession. And the regional council's decisions serve to safeguard these moral principles, potential dis disciplinary measures for those breaking the deontological rules include warning, suspension, expulsion, depending on how serious the effects are. I use this word a little bit in my thesis, deontological is a little bit of an arcane word. It kind of means ethical, it's a little bit of a synonym. Um, last but not least, it's really important to notice that, uh, if you can go back a little bit, last but not least, it's really important to notice that to fulfill uh, its duty of training, to overcome the traditional criticism on the level of preparation of the category, and also to favor the new ways of accessing the profession, the order is promoting the, cre promoted the creation of a small network of journalism schools. Uh, this will, as a, is a detail, but we will circle back on it, on it and during the finding uh, section of the thesis. Members of the order are divided into two main categories, professionals, and those who are called publicisti in Italian, publicisti doesn't really mean much, it means like those who publish something. I translated it with publishers, it could be freelancers as well. And the publishers are those journalists who carry out the professional activity on a non occasion and paid basis, even if they exercise other professions. And access to this list takes place thanks to the certification of the director that proves the effective performance of a regularly paid advertising activity for at least two years and the candidates to pass an oral exam about the laws that regulate the journalistic profession in the country. Um, it's quite different from the list of professionals. They are journalists who exclusively and continuously practice the profession. Uh, to access this order, you must be 21 years old. You must be already registered in the training register. The training will be the publisher register. And uh, you must have pa passed a professional examination. Two details that are important to notice. When we talk about two years of paid advertising activity for the publishers, those two years mean that you basically just uh, just have to publish one article per month. You just have to you, you don't have to make that much money during those two years. So usually those opportunities are not too complicated to find. Is that when we talk about like eighteen months of practice journalism, uh, here we are talking about a real journalistic position, a nine to five job with a regular journalistic contract. So it's a little bit of a different thing, and. Dealing with the exam, the exam for publishers is not overly complicated. I passed it myself. It's, uh, um, it's mainly uh, a pro forma. It's, it's why like the professional examination for, for professionals is a nationwide examination that takes place in Rome and uh, it's way more complicated. It's divided into a written and an oral portion. Um, the written component is based on, the, on like writing three different articles, and instead the oral portion tends to focus on the history of journalism, psychology, sociology, ethics, and norms that relate the profession, as well as discussion about recent news and, and events. 
as about 50% of the people fail the test, and this test is take, uh, can be taken only once per year, you know, it's uh, only once per year, you know. A lot of like uh, journalists profession that are actually professionalists stay to the publishers that their whole life, regardless of working nine to five as, as journalists. Uh, the main uh, advantage of being a professional rather than a freelancer is that professional enjoy more protection in the definition of an employment contract as they can refer to a national collective contract agreement and also is a huge boost for our resume being part of the professional register. Now, I know that like giving students attention span is about seven minutes. I already talked for at least seven minutes. I will ask you seven more minutes for this, this story for review that's gonna be a little bit more trickier, uh, but we will pull through. And I did this historical review to try and understand uh, why the order was founded, what happened, and uh, like, we'll give a little bit of background context behind it. Uh, it is generally agreed that journalism as a, prof uh, as a profession in Italy began in the year 1877 with the foundation of the Association of Italian Periodical Press. Italy as a country was unified about 16 years earlier, in 1861, but like, up until that moment there were no uh, press association and, and like the only uh, constitution that was talking about the press was the Statuto Albertino that was a constitution of the Kingdom of Sardinia that was eventually extended to the whole Italy once unified. So this is basically the main, the first moment where we talk about an Italian press in the coverage history. The statute of this asso association was the, uh, divided journalists into three categories, the effective ones, the publicists, and the visitors. So it was already like pretty similar to what it has nowadays. Moving forward to 1908, the National Federation of the Journalistic Press was founded, and the, pre the profession received its first official legal, legal recognition with, uh, when the law number 406 granted journalists eight railway receipts with a 75 fair discount percent per discount, and only individuals who make journalism their usual sole and paid profession were eligible for those discounts, so it was actually recognizing uh, the profession. Uh, it's pretty important to notice that within this law was also established, uh, established a special commission at the state railways, which had the mandate to compile a roster of directors, editors, and correspondents of newspapers to whom these receipts might have been issued. This will come pretty handy for this guy, this guy, Benito Mussolini, took over in Italy in 1922, and in 1924, uh, he founded the fascist union of journalists. And that same register that I was just telling you about was uh, then used when, in 1925, there was an agreement between uh, the Federation of the Press and the Journal Publishers to create in each region a joint committee of journalists and publishers. And this committee was tasked to compile that local register of active professional journalists. You may imagine this was a pretty important step for Mussolini. Again, a dictator wants to control the press, and having a list of all the press members is a first step towards uh, accomplish that goal. Uh, in 1925, again in December, with the law 2307, uh, the order of journalists was technically established, and ideally this order should have taken over the creation of this register, and only those, only those registers would have been allowed to practice the profession. Eventually, uh, this law was never applied and the order was not created by Mussolini because in 1926, it was instead created a unique syndicate of public right uh, for all categories of professionals. So all the old orders, old orders were preserved, but the new ones and the ones that were in the process of being established, like the order of journalists, were instead banned. Uh, in 1928, the, um, there was uh, a royal decree that made rules for the establishment of the professional register of journalists. So the register was uh, actually made a real thing, but uh, the order was still not created. And this, in this register, journalists were already divided in professional, trainees, and publicists, really aching to happen. Nowadays, the big difference is that this register was controlled by the government, while nowadays the order of journalists is controlled by journalists themselves. Um, after the war, actually not really after the war, like two years before the end of the war when fascism collapsed, 
the Federation of the Press was reestablished and the government issued a decree that replaced the international committees uh, for the register and the Commission Superior for the Press with a single commission based in Rome. Uh, we move forward 16 years, we arrived in 1959 when Mr. Gomella, the Minister of Justice, introduced uh, with the bill number 1563, uh, the, the law that is called the Regulation of the Journalistic Profession. Uh, the, Senate, the Senate approved this law in 1963 and the order was officially established. There's a pretty huge gap here that is complicated to explain because we know, we know we go from the order that is trying to establish this, uh, we go from fascism that is trying to, trying to establish the order to 1943 where people are trying to go back and get the situation as it was before the fascism. And then again in 1963, a little bit like weird and unexplicably, uh, we go back to, to something that is really similar to what was going on during fascism. Uh, it's really uh, complicated to understand why, particularly like if we look at what, what was going on in the post-war and the rest of the world, world where like Western societies and democracies were basically going in the opposite direction to what, with respect to what was going on in Italy. In 1948, a United Nations conference in Geneva on freedom of information approved uh, a draft convention on the rights of correspondence to gather news freely, but it was never submitted to individual countries for their approval because of an effort by the Soviet bloc to add other provisions like uh, licensing journalists. So the Western societies didn't want a licensing system of journalists, and they were more like the Soviet bloc. that was under still like Stalin was still alive. There was still use of the USSR and they were still trying to licensing journalists. Uh, 12 years later, the case the Becker versus Belgium uh, in 1960 uh, attracted interest internationally. It was basically the Becker, here we're talking about three years before the Italian journalist order was founded, and the Becker was this guy who was sentenced to death after being found guilty of aiding Nazism during the World War II while serving as the editor of a Belgian newspaper. And eventually, uh, after receiving a life ban on exercising some rights, uh, including working as a journalist, his death sentence was commuted and he was allowed to leave jail. And the Becker complained to the court about this ban, saying that um, uh, this ban on, uh, violated his freedom of speech. Uh, eventually, the commission determined that because of the back restriction was inflexible and permanent, it actually violated his right to free speech. This is a pretty important uh, step because as analyzed in uh, an article that I read called Licensing of Journalists, uh, although the commission did not entirely rule out the possibility of a ban, the decision has to get us to the light of the extreme circumstances circumstances of this case, namely that the Becker had committed treason while Belgium was at war under an enemy occupation. This suggests that prohibiting access to journalism through a licensing system could never be legitimate. So uh, we have 1948, where the United Nations are basically going on in the opposite direction. We have 1960 with this the Becker versus Belgium case that suggests that uh, licensing journalists should not be legitimate. And then, in the 1980s, we had the American Society of the Newspaper Editors that, while expressing opposition to numerous uh, Latin American countries that were trying to force journalists to get government licenses, uh, the society expressed that in licensing lies control and a controlled press is not free, is not for it cannot be independent and free. Moving back to Italy, in 1968, we have a pretty important constitutional sentence. On June 5th, 1967, the magistrate of Catania, Sicily, raised various, various issues of constitutional, constitutional legitimacy regarding uh, the law that established the order. In particular, the magistrate uh, noticed that the possibility of engaging in journalistic activity, uh, according to this law, is left entirely upon the discretion of publishers, newspaper directors, and journalists who already have obtained reg uh, registration. Oh, yeah, that for him represented an issue. Also, you notice that registration on the list of policies is subjected to the verification of directors of publication and, uh, and confirmation of your work for at least two years, and this comes with the risk of potential ideological censorship, according to him. 
Uh, last but not least, uh, well, Article 21 of the Constitution guarantees everyone the right to be free expression of the ideas. Article 36 of that law establishing the order uh, places condition on foreigners and enrollment, and the restriction on enrollment to those who have practiced their profession in, accord in accordance with local laws muzzles the free speech of those who are citizens of nations that do not uphold press freedom. Uh, the court eventually found that it was not for the court to consider the advisability of the creation of, of, of the order and then found it legitimate because it leaves intact the right of everyone to express their thoughts through the newspaper. Uh, the register is obligatory only for those who manifest uh, by profession and it protects with the ontology the freedom of the members against the opposing economic power of the employers and the disciplinary powers conferred on the councils are not as such as to compromise the freedom of the members. Uh, right after this, this sentence, in 1972, started like some movements and some sort of like uh, riots against, against the order. In 1972, three deputies of the Italian Republican Party presented a proposal divided into seven articles to asking for the suppression of the law establishing the order. In the 80s, the mandatory register was then proposed to be replaced with a professional identity card after the French model. And the, pro the proposal came from politicians Francesco Rutelli and Marco Panella. Uh, in 1997, in the professional identity card idea became one of the seven persons of the abrogative referendum wanted by the radicals. And it's pretty really interesting to notice that in this referendum, 8.5 million Italians voted against the order of journalists. The big thing is that in Italy, a referendum to be legit it has to reach a quorum of 50% plus one of voters of those who have the ability to vote, and that referendum didn't reach the quorum. So although the vast majority of people voted, voted against the order of journalists, uh, the referendum was not legit because it was lacking the quorum. Uh, in 2010, Silvio Berlusconi uh, tried again, again to erase the order and establish a working group to prepare a law to that effect, but the, government, the Berlusconi government fell a year later, and this attempt failed as well. The latest attempt was by the Italian political party Movimento Cinque Stelle, the Five Star Movement, in 2018. They presented two bills in the Senate uh, to abolish the order of journalists, and needless to say, they failed uh, as well. It's pretty important to notice that in 2020, the European Com Commission itself uh, expressed its discomfort with the Italian journalist order uh, in, in a document redacted in 2020. Uh, as regards the indicator of access to the journalistic profession, Italy is the only European nation with a medium risk rating for the indicator of access. And as reported in the document, the system of enrollment in the register of journalists can be interpreted on the basis of international standards as an unjustified barrier to overcome in order to enter the profession. Now, bear with me a little bit longer. We are almost done. Uh, the last component of my research was a comparison between what happens in Italy and what happens in other countries. I, I decided to analyze six different countries, uh, United Kingdom, France, Brazil, China, Australia, and United States. And in United Kingdom, before, uh, behind, beyond the defamation laws, there are virtually no restriction on anything journalistic related. There is no necessity to register a newspaper, no requirement to be a director, or no, no, no requirement to have a labor agreement as well. The journalists basically just receive a press card that recognizes them, them for their profession, and to obtain one, journalists just has to prove uh, that most of their income comes from journalistic related sources. In Australia and the United States, the situation is pretty similar. In Australia, uh, journalists can apply for the international press card, and then we receive it just by proving their status as journalists. And we have the Media and Entertainment and Arts Alliance, uh, that is the biggest union that is dedicated to protecting the journalists' rights. While in the United States there is no recognized professional charter, the Society of Professional Journalists pro promotes journalistic conduct, but does not issue any identification cards to the members. And the press pass is issued to members of the press to obtain some privileges, such as participating in certain events, but to get it, the journalist just has to apply and prove his position as a journalist. A little bit different situation in France, it's more similar to what happens in Italy. In France, so, uh, the journalistic uh, status was established by a judicial act uh, in 1935, and the status is characterized by the implementation of a professional journalist card. The main difference is that uh, a commission made up equally of journalists and media owner representatives issues this, this card, 
and this car must be renewed every th three years, and, but it just substantially recognizes uh, journalists symbolically and makes it simpler to take advantage of several social benefits. And it's pretty important to notice also that there's no exam to obtain this card. This card is automatically assigned to those who have worked as journalists for at least three consecutive months, so not that long. Uh, in Brazil, in Brazil, we have 10 major conglomerates that share the journalistic market. And up until a few years ago, you had to have a high school diploma to exercise the journalistic profession. But in 2009, the Supreme Federal Court declared unconstitutional the requirement of a high school diploma. So things are actually changing. And last but not least, in China, Chinese constitution technically allows the citizens freedom of speech and press. But the media regulation also leaves authorities free to crack down on news stories if they endanger the country. And in China, journalists are required as well to pass a, a test. This test is about the history of communism, journalistic laws, and the differences between the West and Eastern approaches to the professional journalists. And the card also can be withdrawn for various reasons. And last but not least, uh, China requires also foreign correspondents to obtain permission before reporting in the country. Now, we dig into the research, the main block is gone. We just want to take a little bit of a step back. These were my three research questions that guided me through the process. Uh, I asked myself and I asked, uh, I, I, I researched what is the history and provenance of Italian law related to licensing journalists? Uh, how might these laws impact or have impacted the practice of journalism in Italy? And how does media licensing in Italy differ from what happens in the rest of the world? In this chapter findings, in, in, uh, in this findings chapter, uh, I try to answer those questions. Particularly the first one uh, is just uh, a little bit of a, of a sum of what we already talked about. The history and provenance of Italian laws related to licensing journalists. We have three main bullet points. In 1877, the Association of Italian Political Press was founded, and it was basically the first uh, journalistic uh, association in the country. Then we have the Fascist laws that technically established the order between 1925 and 1928, and then the order of journalists was actually established in 1963. These are the three main uh, historical components. Um, as from like an historical and sociological point of view, it sounds like uh, it's hard to find elements in favor of the order. It cannot be said that everything within the order itself is, is wrong. Uh, Again, the order has this journalistic deontology. They sort of is a sort of moral code that some people view as a shield from journalists, for journalists, particularly for two aspects. Uh, in Italy, with Articles 2104 and 2105 of the Civil Code, established that the worker's duty is to respect the employer and basically do what the employer asks him to do. This doesn't apply, thanks to the journalistic deontology, this doesn't really apply to journalists because the first responsibility of a journalist is to impartially present the public with the facts. So uh, if your employer technically asks you to do something like, I don't like that guy, you should talk bad about it, and you, you, you don't have to do it because your first responsibility is to present the public with the facts. And another important thing that is presented with the ontology is that it protects the journalistic sources, and so it guarantees uh, protection for the sources that is pretty important for journalists. Uh, responding to the question, uh, how the order impacts and has impacted the practice of journalism in Italy, uh, I found like different levels of problematics within the order. Uh, particularly, too many people have access to the freelance level, and while like the access to the professional level remains overly complicated, uh, even for real journalists to comply with, many people will reach the freelance level for them not even practicing the profession. This creates a lot of confusion as real journalists and professional of other sectors of the line in the same group. Just to put it in numbers, in Italy we have about 110,000 journalists. It's one journalist every 560 citizens. In America we have 4,000 journalists. It's one journalist every 100,000, uh, about 100,000 people. So the numbers are really different. And the fact that so many people get to the uh, Publisher level is due to two main facts. First, that a lot of people try to become journalists. They get to the publisher level and they decide that like their talents. Uh, we have ten more minutes, but we may probably have to go out and come back here again. But we'll figure it out. 
Publishers, yeah. Uh, jo um, journalists, a lot, of, a lot of journalists, aspiring journalists get to the uh, publisher level and then they decide that their talents are better expressed in other fields, but they maintain the professional cast so they're still registered as journalists, although doing something completely different. Another um, thing is that a lot of people that don't even practice the journalistic profession, like a doctor, for example, a doctor that publishes one article per month in a scientific newspaper, can apply for the publisher level and uh, obtain access to it. So like we have these two categories of people that are members of the order technically and they usually just use the order to adapt to their advantage because like being a member of the order you can ask for free tickets for soccer games, concerts, uh, participate to press conferences. So some people just become members of the order mainly for this reason. And while people who have other jobs can have access to the order without even knowing it, again like the example of the doctor, uh, those who really want to become journalists often cannot afford to spend two years practicing just to get to the freelance level. Uh, this is because a really important like, requirements to get to the freelance level is working for two years and getting paid at least 2,000 euros. 2,000 euros for two years is about like 80 euros per month, per month, so it's not really like you can make a living out of it. And so uh, the thing is that this law was made because uh, the government was trying to prevent people from uh, employing aspiring journalists without paying them. At the same time, accidentally, it put like a bar to set the employment contracts for aspiring journalists. So nowadays in Italy, it's really complicated if you're not a publisher. If you're not a publisher yet, it's really complicated to find uh, a position that pays you more than 2,000 euros in two years, which is really not much, and people who cannot afford it just cannot do it. Also, uh, Going to the next step, it's becoming increasingly, increasingly challenging to just attempt the professional examination without going through master schools in journalism. This is because, again, after taking those two years, getting paid only 2,000 euros for two years, the idea would be that you should find a regular journalistic job for 18 months and then you can uh, apply for the exam. The thing is that uh, most of the newspapers and media in Italy don't hire people to that contract for 18 months unless they are already a member of a master's school. So like people who cannot afford to go through two years of basically being unpaid and, uh, and then cannot afford to pay for a master's school, uh, it's really complicated for them to have access to the uh, profession. Uh, another big problem with the order uh, is definitely um, the one underlined during the 1968 trial if the possibility of undertaking the journalistic activities may depend on the complete discretion of the publisher, newspapers, editors, and the earlier registered journalists, this may create some form of ideological censorship. We are really there. This is the second to last slide where to look for possible solutions. I, again, analyzed those uh, six countries and I divided them into three groups. The restricted group, restricted group with China and Brazil, the freedom of a bubble group with the US, UK, and Australia as representatives, and the in between group with France and Italy as well could be in the in between. And I try to understand within those groups which one could be a good example of uh, something that Italy should try to copy and emulate to change and to find. Uh, a better solution to this problem. Uh, the restricted group uh, doesn't look like a solution for me. Uh, a state control censorship mechanism like the Chinese one would not repair uh, Italian issues and it would also not be accepted internationally by the closest Italian allies and also a propaganda department already existed in Italy during the fascism and now we all know how it went. So uh, this doesn't look like a possible solution. Also, like the main issue with uh, the Italian system is the examination, and the Chinese system would not resolve this issue because they have an examination as well. Dealing with Brazil, the main issue would be related to the fact that most media are owned by the same entities and are too heavily entangled with the government, so that doesn't look like a proper solution to me. Uh, looking at the Freedom of the World group, uh, access to the profession is free in all of them, it's not required to join any order, and the press is not subjected to almost any form of uh, Repression. This sounds pretty enticing for journalists like myself, but uh, the negative impact of the phone hacking scandal involving Rupert Murdoch in newspapers in England in 2011 
made me think that maybe uh, this one is not a proper solution as well. This came in 2011, basically involved uh, Rupert Murdoch newspapers and uh, the journalists who were working with them. They were accused of basically tacking and wiring uh, VIPs and even normal people to uh, receive information and gather news. And uh, this kind of represented a huge issue and damaged the relationship between journalists and readers. And on top of that, a country that has been pretty restrictive so far as Italy does not look, does not look likely to turn into the complete opposite from one day to the other. Uh, last, France, the other member of the in between group. Uh, France has an order, uh, has an order themselves too. They have an order themselves too, and this order protects its members uh, and has some positive values that Italy may want to maintain mm -hmm. against those values that we mentioned uh, before we talked about the ecological part. And the big thing about France is that replacing the exam with a membership guarantee just by previous experiences could represent a solution to open up more the access to the profession and uh, particularly would also prevent people who don't actually exercise the profession to be part of it. Also again, like people with, without an exam, people do not have to go through master schools and through that whole process that makes everything more complicated in Italy. And the idea of renewing the card every three years could also help in maintaining within the order only people who are actively practicing the profession. But on the other side, another appointed by government decree may risk being subjected to some sort of governmental and political pressure, which would not be ideal. Conclusion. The king is dead, we are at the end. And this thesis mainly confirmed the initial hypothesis. The Italian licensing system has some issues that represents hindrances for the profession. Uh, arrived at this conclusion, three questions have been answered. The first related to the history behind the order and the laws that govern it, uh, furnished a general background of the context that, uh, in which the actual system was born. Uh, the second question related to the impact the order and its laws uh, had on those who practice the profession, uh, revealed that many people have been affected throughout the years by its policies. We saw all the people that protest, protest against the order, those 8 million people that voted against it. And the last question related to possible solution proved that while this remains a complicated and debated topic, the other countries and allies have opted for all for different ways to handle it. It also showed that Italy doesn't have to completely steer away and change its system uh, to solve most of the issues within the order. The country just would, could take example for what happens on the other side of the Alps in France, at least initially taking inspiration from French, uh, could help a young aspiring journalist and give freer access to the profession and potentially lead in the future to other perhaps more drastic changes like a totally free model following the United Kingdom the United States uh, blueprints. We have 90 seconds left and I'm done. <laughs>